And uh, with that, let's uh, get into our study of God's Word tonight. We're going to uh, do two chapters again tonight in our trek through uh, the Bible, book by book and chapter by chapter, verse by verse. So uh, chapters 23 and 24, uh, you can turn there at this time if you're not there already. And uh, why don't we begin with a word of prayer, and we'll ask God's blessing on our time together in His Word, if you would join with me. Loving Heavenly Father, we love you, we love your word, and we love this time that we have together on a Thursday night to just put aside all the cares and the affairs of our busy lives and focus our attention on you and what you have for us here in your word. Lord, would you enable us by the Holy Spirit to give you our undivided attention with no distractions? Lord, will you speak into our lives through your word? And when you do, Lord, speak clearly in that still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to hear and heed your word tonight. So, Lord, speak. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, before we jump in, I think we need a little bit of a backstory uh, here before we pick it up in chapter 23. Last week, we were introduced to a very wicked woman by the name of Athalia. And uh, no surprise, she's uh, the daughter of one Ahab and Jezebel, so uh, no wonder. But last week in the previous chapter, we were told that she had actually murdered all of her own grandchildren, her own flesh and blood, and she did so in order to stay in power, to eliminate any potential threat to the throne. And this is right out of Ahab and Jezebel's evil playbook. You might say that the apple certainly did not fall too far from the tree in this case. And then we were also introduced to Jehosheba, who takes Joash, who at the time is about one year old, and hides him from this wicked Athaliah, who would have certainly killed him, and she ends up hiding him for a total of six years, as we're going to see uh, tonight. Very interesting. And what she does is very interesting for a couple of reasons, both of which relate to the reason that she takes Joash and takes it upon herself to hide this one remaining son who's the only remaining descendant of King David, which is from the lineage of the Messiah. Uh, last week, and we'll see it again tonight, that God reminds them of his covenant with David. And this covenant with David, that there will always be an heir to the throne that would come from the line of David, and that cannot be broken. And this is why she does what she does. And more importantly, is that this would be the only remaining descendant that from whom would come the Savior of the world. And so she hides him away from this Athalia, who has no idea. As far as she's concerned, she has eliminated every potential heir to the throne. The second reason this is interesting is that it's for six years. And that is, to me, a type of the six years for the history of mankind. Six, of course, the number of man. Peter tells us that to God, a thousand years for us is like one day to him. So a thousand years is like six days. Six, the number of men, and seven the number of completion. And again, as we're going to see tonight, he is revealed. 
this king, this Joash, is revealed in the seventh year after six years of this evil reign. Now, if you really think about it, for six long years, it almost seemed like God's word and God's promise had somehow failed. Nobody knows about Joash. As far as everyone is concerned, she has succeeded in eliminating every potential heir to the throne. And so too is this true in the, in the type, typological sense of for 6,000 long years, it seems that God in his covenant, in his promise of the Lord's return has somehow not been fulfilled. And what's even more interesting by way of the typology is, again, it's that seventh year. It's that seventh 1,000th year, the millennial reign, when Jesus Christ rules and reigns in the kingdom age on earth, and the earth is going to be like it was before sin entered the world. You know, we talk about the rapture and eternity future, but do you realize that we have a 1,000 year period of time, that millennial reign, the kingdom age, and we're going to be in our glorified bodies for 1,000 years ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ, seated on the throne with him as his bride by his side. And then, after that 1,000 years, that's when Satan is finally loosed, where he's been for 1,000 years, from the bottomless pit, and then he's cast into the lake of fire. And then it's the new heaven and the new earth for all eternity in the new Jerusalem at that time. And it comes at the end, subsequent to that period of seven, seven being the number of completion. I don't want to get too far off on that, but I do find it interesting as we see this typology here with the six years being hid before he's finally revealed. Well, oh, one last thing, which is kind of a interesting side note. Um, Joash is hid in the temple the one place where Athalia would never find him. <laughs> that's the one place she's never going to go, and that's why successfully he's hid for six years in the temple. If you want to hide your money from your kids, put it in the Bible. They'll never find it. <laughs> okay, let's move on. <laughs> Verse 1, chapter 23. In the seventh year, Jehoiada strengthened himself and made a covenant with the captains of hundreds. Azariah, the son of Jero Jeroham, Ishmael, the son of Jehahanan, Azariah, the son of Abed, Maaseiah, the son of Adaiah, and Eleshaphat, the son of Zikri. And verse 2, they went throughout Judah and gathered the Levites from all the cities of Judah and the chief fathers of Israel, and they came to Jerusalem. Then all the assembly made a covenant with the king in the house of God. And he said to them, Behold, the king's son shall reign as the Lord has said of the sons of David. This is what you shall do, verse 4. One third of you entering on the Sabbath of the priests and the Levites shall be keeping watch over the doors. One third shall be at the king's house and one third at the gate of the foundation. All the people shall be in the courts of the house of the Lord. This is actually very strategic during the shift change there in the temple. And that's when they're going to reveal him. Verse 6, but let no one come into the house of the Lord except the priests and those of the Levites who serve. They may go in, for they are holy, but all the people shall keep the watch of the Lord and verse 7, the Levites shall surround the king on all sides, every man with his weapons in his hand, and whoever comes into the house, let him be put to death. You are to be with the king when he comes in and when he goes out. Now keep in mind, Joash is six years old at this point. Actually, he's going to be uh, seven years old by the time he is revealed and anointed as king. Can you imagine how glorious this must have been for them. They've been oppressed 
by this wicked and evil reign for six long years. And again, as far as they're concerned, there was no legitimate king that would be a surviving heir to the throne of David's royal line. And now they're about to get the surprise of their lives. This is another but God, isn't it? But God, true to his word and true to his promise, on the seventh day, there it is again, in the seventh year, reveals and anoints their true king. There's something else here that is really um, intriguing to me, and I think it's sort of impossible to overstate just how amazing this was, in that it took Jehoiada stepping out with a bold faith in carrying this out. He knew full well that in his bold stance in confronting the evil of Athalia, that that could have absolutely cost him his life. Yet he does it anyway. And to me, this speaks to the paramount importance of stepping out in faith and trusting God no matter the personal cost. It's kind of a reminder to me of what Job said, though he slay me, yet will I praise him. Reminds me too of what Esther said when she was going to approach the king without being summoned, knowing full well that if he didn't put out his scepter, she was done. She was killed on the spot. It was something that was punishable by death. And she says to Mordecai, listen, this is what I have to do. And if I perish, I perish. But I have to do this. And I, I see Jehoiada in the same way. He knows he has to do this. And he knows that it could cost him his life. Yet he does it. And that takes great faith. I think we do err greatly when we refuse to take risks by faith under the banner of playing it safe. We just kind of want to, you know, very cautiously and, and kind of self-protective and that self-preservation kicks in and we don't step out in faith. And the writer of Hebrews tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And that means that with faith, it is possible and certainly we do please God. F.B. Meyer had some interesting insight into this. He says, the easiest thing for Jehoiada would have been to shut himself up in the temple and leave things to take their course. The noblest thing was to come forth and boldly confront the rampant evil of his time. The world, and this is interesting, is full of Athalias. <laughs> and it is not befitting that the Jehoiadas should remain at their holy rites and services if there is a paramount need for action in the world's battlefield in the strife against wrong. Boy, how apropos is that for us today? This taking a stand for righteousness. And what is entailed in taking a stand for righteousness is to confront evil, to speak up, to step out, and by faith trust God no matter what, no matter the cost, because of what's at stake. Verse 8, so the Levites and all Judah did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded, and each man took his men who were to be on duty on the Sabbath with those who were going off duty on the Sabbath, for Jehoiada, the priest, had not dismissed the divisions. And verse 9, Jehoiada, the priest, gave to the captains of hundreds the spears and the large and small shields which had belonged to King David that were in the temple of God. Then he said, all the people, every man with his weapon in his hand, from the right side of the temple to the left side of the temple, along by the altar and by the temple, all around the king, 
And verse 11, they brought out the king's son, put the crown on him, gave him the testimony, and made him king. Then Jehoiada and his sons anointed him and said, Long live the king. Now, <laughs> meanwhile, <laughs> when Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king, she came to the people in the temple of the Lord. When she looked, there was the king standing by his pillar at the entrance, and the leaders and the trumpeters were by the king. All the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets, also the singers with musical instruments and those who led in praise. That was the praise and worship team. So what is her response? <laughs> so Athalia tore her clothes and said, Treason, treason! And Jehoiada the priest brought out the captains of hundreds who were set over the army and said to them, Take her outside under guard and slay with the sword whoever follows her. For the priest had said, Do not kill her in the house of the Lord. I don't want to clean up the mess. <laughs> so they seized her, and she went by way of the entrance of the horse gate into the king's house, and they killed her there. Good riddance. Good riddance couple thoughts here on this gnarly narrative, if I can call it that. The first is that this passage, this account, should be a source of great encouragement and hope to us today. And the reason is, is that it points to that great and final day when our greater than Joash our King, our King Jesus, is anointed after 6,000 long years of evil, reigning, seemingly unchecked. I think of what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 73. Really, he was messed up, stumbled greatly in his faith, having a full-on crisis of faith. Why? Because it seemed that evil was prevailing that it was going unchecked. And he said, my, my foot almost slipped. I almost stumbled. It almost cost me to fall away. Lord, where are you? Why do you let this continue? Why is this evil allowed? Why are the Athalias of this world allowed to prevail in this way for this long? And I love what he says at the end of the psalm. In fact, this is the go-to psalm for anyone who is really struggling with the evil in this world, as it waxes more and more evil, seemingly, by the day. Psalm 73, he says that it was until I went into the house of the Lord. That's a good place to go. You go into the temple of the Lord, the, the church, of Jesus Christ. And there the Lord showed him their end. And it was like, okay, all right. God's delays are not God's denials. Justice will not be denied. It might be delayed, but it will not be denied. Their end is coming. And he was okay with that. And he rested in that. And he trusted in that. And he was able to get through that. F.B. Meyer we referred to this as the anointing and enthroning of our king after a cruel and murderous tyranny of the usurper. For 6,000 years, the devil has wreaked havoc in his evil on this fallen world, but that day is coming to an end. And I would suggest, I'll take it a step further and suggest that we are at the end of the sixth year, that six thousandth year, as it were, and our greater than Joash is about to be anointed and enthroned soon and very soon. G. Campbell Morgan of this wrote, her own treason, speaking of Athalia, against the true and abiding king of the nation was defeated. 
Thus, sooner or later, and in ways equally dramatic, the moment arrives when those who plot and plan against heaven and righteousness find themselves looking at the evidences of the triumph of God and of goodness over all their wickedness. Be encouraged tonight. This evil, this wickedness will come to an end. God will have the final word. God is just, and it will come, hopefully very soon. <laughs> it should be noted that the judgment that was meted out on Athaliah was actually in accordance with the law of Moses. This was punishable by death. Anyone who would turn God's people away from the worship of God, which is exactly what she had done. Now I mention this because God takes very seriously the leading of his people astray. I think about Proverbs chapter 7, I think it is, maybe chapter 6, where we have the list of the six things that God hates, and the seventh is an abomination to him. And what is that seventh that is an abomination? It's those who sow discord amongst the brethren, because that turns people away from God. People want nothing to do with the Lord. People want nothing to do with church. God takes that very seriously. God hates it. It's an abomination. And that's, in a sense, what Athali had done. She had been fully given over to the worship of Baal in leading Israel to sin, as we're about to see. When Joash is king, they go in, and the first thing they do is get rid of all of the idolatry, all of the Baal worship that was in the temple. In the temple. Be like, in this church, having this worship of these false gods taking place in the temple of God, if you can imagine. That's how bad it was. And God takes that very seriously. It's an abomination to him. Verse 16, then Jehoiada made a covenant between himself, the people, and the king, that they should be the Lord's people. And all the people went into the temple of Baal and tore it down. <laughs> They broke in pieces its altars and images and killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. Also Jehoiada appointed the oversight of the house of the Lord to the hand of the priests, the Levites, whom David had assigned in the house of the Lord to offer the burnt offerings of the Lord, as it is written in the law of Moses, with rejoicing and with singing, as it was established by David. And verse 19, he set the gatekeepers at the gates of the house of the Lord so that no one who was in any way unclean should enter. Then he took the captains of hundreds, the nobles, the governors of the people, and all the people of the land, and brought the king down from the house of the Lord. And they went through the upper gate to the king's house and set the king on the throne of the kingdom. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet. Why? For they had slain Athalia with the sword. Wow. Did you notice something here? The first thing the king and the people do after making a covenant was to thoroughly break down and completely destroy all of this Baal worship. All of this worship to and this worship of Baal. And not only do they break everything into pieces, they do so with zeal. <laughs> they are praising God as they're doing it. I, I kind of imagine that they were excited, enthusiastic, and they were just rejoicing that they could finally get rid of all of this Baal worship. It seems that they had suffered enough. They had suffered enough under this evil and this wickedness. Keep in mind, they went to bed the night before thinking, there's no king, there's no heir. And it, think of the sway, if I can say it that way, from going from this place of hopelessness and despair, thinking this evil will continue for the rest of my life. And then they wake up the next day, unbeknownst to them, wait a minute, 
there's this Joash <laughs> that was hidden in the temple, the heir from the lineage of David, and they go from hopelessness to now hopefulness, and they're rejoicing. And finally, we have a righteous rule, we have a righteous reign. And this is what the proverb says, chapter 29, verse 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Proverbs 11.10 says, When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. And when the wicked perish, there is jubilation. They are celebrating the death of this wicked Athaliah. Chapter 24, verse 1. Joash was seven years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibiah of Beersheba. Joash, verse 2, did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And this is an interesting detail. All the days of Jehoiada the priest. Hang on to that. We're going to come back to that. And Jehoiada took two wives for him, and he had sons and daughters. Now, please know that whenever you read about someone taking multiple wives, that it's not God condoning it. This is really God recording it, not condoning it. So please don't think, hey, it's right here in the Bible. He took, and Jehoiada, he's the priest, and he gets two wives for him. No, this is not... Uh, biblical. <laughs> and uh, it's just a record of what had happened. So the chapter begins by telling us that Joash was a good king, finally. Now keep in mind that there are only nine of whom it is said they did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And as we've seen in our study through the books of First and Second Kings and also First Chronicles as well, that of those nine good kings, eight of them messed up towards the end of their lives. They didn't finish well. And sadly, Joash is one of those eight who started well. He was a good king. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But towards the end of his life, he did not finish well. Verse 4, now it happened after this, that Joash set his heart on repairing the house of the Lord. Then he gathered the priests and the Levites and said to them, Go out to the cities of Judah and gather from all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year and see that you do it quickly. However, the Levites did not do it quickly. Sounds like how fast things go here on the island. But anyway, <laughs> so the king called Jehoiada, the chief priest, and said to him, Why have you not required the Levites to bring in from Judah and from Jerusalem the collection according to the commandment of Moses, the servant of the Lord and of the assembly of Israel for the tabernacle of witness? Verse 7, For the sons of Athaliah, that wicked woman, had broken into the house of God and had also presented all the dedicated things of the house of the Lord to the Baals. Then at the king's command, verse 8, they made a chest, this is their agape box, <laughs> and they set it outside at the gate of the house of the Lord. And they made a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem to bring to the Lord the collection that, the, that Moses, the servant of God, had imposed on Israel in the wilderness. Then, verse 10, all the leaders and all the people rejoiced, brought their contributions, and put them into the chest until all had given. So it was at that time when the chest was brought to the king's official by the hand of the Levites, and when they saw that there was much money, that the king's scribe and the high priest's officer came and emptied the chest and took it and returned it to its place. Thus they did day by day and gathered money in abundance. In other words, they took an offering every single day. <laughs> How's that? Verse 12, the king and Jehoiada gave it to those who did the work of the service of the house of the Lord, and they hired masons and carpenters to repair the house 
of the Lord, and also those who worked in iron and bronze to restore the house of the Lord. So verse 13, the workmen labored, and the work was completed by them. They restored the house of God to its original condition and reinforced it. So here we're told that Joash redirected these monies to the repair of the temple, which it sounds like was sorely needed. Must have been in a tremendous state of disrepair. We're even told why and how it became like that. It was because of Athaliah. One commentator suggested that the reason the temple needed so much work was because Athalia and her evil sons actually vandalized it. They actually stole from it, and they vandalized it, and they destroyed it, and they took things out of it for the worship of Baal. And think about this. This is, this is really interesting. Uh, no surprise that Joe Ash would make this his first priority. Uh, within the first 100 days of, in office. <laughs> no, I, just, I digress. <laughs> but did you see that press conference today? Anyway, that was the likes of which I have never seen. Uh, that was really interesting. Yeah, I'm still processing it. It was, um, actually, I wish I would have recorded that. I would have liked to have watched that again. Of course, they're re-airing it over and over again. It was just, you can say what you want to say, and this is all I'm going to say, but this, you can say what you want to say about Trump, but I mean, he just tells it like it is. I mean, I, I, how refreshing is that? How refreshing is that? He, he tells, is this okay if I do this? Of course, what are you gonna say, no? <laughs> I mean, he tells CNN, you're lying. I, <laughs> and you're fake news. And, he's, and then he said, you're not just fake news, you're very fake news. And then this guy from, I felt so sorry for the guy from BBC. And, and Trump goes, where, where are you from? He says, BBC. He goes, oh, there's, there's another beauty. <laughs> I mean, and it was so classic because, I mean, he just, he says to them, he says, you know, people don't believe you anymore. And he's right. They don't. Okay, I feel better now. Let's get back to our Bible study already in progress. <laughs> it was so good. It was so good. I couldn't believe it. Can't wait for the next one, but anyway. <laughs> All right, where were we? We were somewhere here in the temple. Oh, yeah. Interesting, very interesting to me that he would make this a priority on day one, basically. Now think about why. He had a soft spot for the temple, didn't he? This is where he was raised for the first six years of his life. I imagine, even as a young child, as a young boy, he's there hid in the temple, and he's walking around in the temple going, wow, that is bus up. He was local. <laughs> this is all bus up. What about this? What about that? And then when he's anointed king, this is his first order of business. This is not right. We need to make the repairs. And he even gets on the Levites because they're dragging their feet. What's taking you so long? Let's, according to the law of Moses, get the monies from God's people to renovate and restore and rebuild the temple of God. And he does it. And it's kind of interesting, the reference to Moses, because remember in our study in Exodus, when we were magnificent detail concerning the tabernacle. And so Moses has the Israelites bring their gifts, their offerings, their money, their gold to the tabernacle, to construct the tabernacle. And they gave so much, it says that Moses had to tell them to stop giving. Now, you'll forgive me, <laughs> but when was the last time a pastor stood up in his pulpit and told God's people, you know what? You guys are so generous. You guys have given so much. We do not need you to give anymore. <laughs> How cool would that be? Anyway, I digress again, but this is kind of what's happening here. The people gave cheerfully and God loves a cheerful giver and they gave abundantly and they completed this renovation of the temple. Verse 14, when they had finished, 
They brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada. They made from it articles for the house of the Lord, articles for serving and offering, spoons and vessels of gold and silver. And they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually all the days of Jehoiada. But, and here's where it kind of turns a corner, Jehoiada grew old and was full of days, and he died. And get this age that he was when he died. He was 130 years old when he died. Wow. And, verse 16, they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and his house. Now, verse 17, after the death of Jehoiada, the leaders of Judah came and bowed down to the king, and the king listened to them. It's sad because this is now where everything will take a turn for the worse in the reign of Joash. He no longer has his mentor. He no longer has Jehoiada, the priest, in his life. And it's sad because the righteous reign of Joash, as we're going to see, seems to have only been extrinsic and not intrinsic in the sense that it came by way of the external influence of Jehoiada. And now that this godly influence in the life of Joash is gone, it seems that Joash is now going to become very ungodly. And uh, that's going to be his end. And we're going to see his end at the end of the chapter and the end of our study tonight. It seems that Jehoiada's godly influence was evidenced not only in the life of Joash as king, but also in the life of Israel as a nation. Charles Spurgeon said it best this way, See the influence of one man. One man can sway a state. One man can check sin. One man can be the head of a host who shall serve God and honor his name. I see a Jehoiada as a spiritual covering. I see the life of Jehoiada as having such a powerful impact on Joash, certainly, but on the entire nation as a whole. Never underestimate the power that one man can have, the influence that one man of God can have. Verse 18, therefore, they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers. And here it is. <laughs> How heartbreaking. And served wooden images and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their trespass. Yet, verse 19, this is God's grace, by the way. He sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord. And they testified against them, but they would not listen. Then, verse 20, the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, who stood above the people and said to them, Thus says God, Why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Stop right there. Did you catch that? The transgressing of the commandments of the Lord, disobeying the commandments of the Lord, disobeying God is the reason that God cannot bless and prosper your life. I think of Proverbs 28, 13, one of the most powerful Proverbs in the entire book basically goes like this. The one who conceals his sin will not prosper, will not be blessed. That's the one who hides their sin, their disobedience against God. But here's the flip side to that. The one who confesses and forsakes, 
That's two things. Confess and forsake will find mercy. This is 1 John 1, 9, likened by many as a Christian bar of soap. It goes like this. If you will confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. But how many of us could it be said of this way? They would not listen. They would not listen. And God cannot bless you. God cannot bless you. God cannot prosper you. And let's flip it over to the other side. If I am obedient to the Lord, I'm living a life of obedience to the Lord, then God can bless me. Let me say it this way. Oftentimes, we tie the hands of God's blessing in our lives with the ropes of our disobedience. And I never imagined God being stingy with his blessing on our lives. God wants to bless us. God waits to bless us. God is looking for ways to bless us, but God cannot bless us. It goes against his character, against his nature, when we're in willful disobedience to him. Let's read on. Why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he also has forsaken you. Now, let's be clear. We know in the new covenant that God will never leave us. God will never forsake us. But you have to understand something. If you forsake God, God will not force himself on you. If you reject the Lord, he will not force his will on you. They had forsaken the Lord, and the Lord had forsaken them. So what do we read? Verse 21, they conspired against him. This is the son of Jehoiada, this godly influence. His name, Zechariah. How old is he? We don't know. What we do know is his godly father, Jehoiada, was a good father, and he was a godly son. He's a prophet, God speaking through his son. And so what is their response to this prophecy concerning their transgression of the commandments of the Lord? So they conspired against him, verse 21, and at the command of the king. What? Joash? Yeah. Wait a minute, what? So the king gives the command as they conspired against him, and at the command of the king, they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord? Are you kidding me? And this came by the hand of Joash? You got to know that Joash knew Zechariah, Jehoiada's son. What happened? <laughs> What happened? What happened to Joash? And oh, by the way, is this not textbook? You don't like the message, so you kill the messenger. <laughs> Literally, that's what they did. They didn't like his prophetic message. They would not listen. They rejected him, and, and then they killed him. And the problem is that whenever one does this, they do so to their own peril. And that's exactly what we're going to see happen here in a moment. But if you're anything like me, and I suspect that you are, you're having a difficult time wrapping your mind around how in the world Joash could do this to Jehoiada's son, no less. And it does beg the question of what happened to this guy? What would make him do something like this? Jehoiada's dead. This is his son. His son prophesies. And at his command, at his command, they kill him. Charles Spurgeon, I think, has the answer for us. Listen to what he says. All that Joash had done was to give his heart 
to Jehoiada, not Jehovah. It is very easy to be outwardly religious by giving your heart to your mother or your father or your aunt or your uncle or some good person who helps you to do what is right. You are doing all this out of love to them, which is at best but a very secondary motive. God says, my son, give me thine heart. He had not given his heart to the Lord. He had given his heart to a man, and now that man is gone. And with it goes everything that was righteous about this man. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And if were it but not recorded for us here in the pages of Holy Writ, I would hardly believe it. And you would be hard pressed to convince me of it, that something like this could happen. But it did. I think this speaks to how important it is to not put our trust in man, to not give our devotion to man. Our devotion has to be to the Lord and to the Lord alone. To Him alone belongs the affection, the devotion, the worship of our hearts. Well, it's going to get worse. <laughs> Verse 22, Thus Joash the king did not remember the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, you think? But killed his son, and as he died, he said, the Lord look on it and repay. Wow! You gotta know that for the rest of his life, which by the way isn't very long, <laughs> as we're gonna see, those words had to have haunted him. Those words had to have kept him up at night. I think of Saul, Saul of Tarsus, when Stephen, the first martyr in the early church, was stoned to death. And there's Saul, who's actually holding the garments. And I, I know those words pierced his soul when Stephen prayed for their salvation. It was akin to what the Savior would do on the cross when he would pray and even plead, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Those final words that would just be indelibly etched on the minds and the hearts of all of those people that heard those words. And I got to wonder, when Saul's on that road to Damascus, and the Lord meets him there, and he comes to Christ there, if that wasn't an answer to prayer, that prayer that was prayed by Stephen on that day, when he prayed for Saul's salvation, and Saul did get saved and would become the Apostle Paul. Well, let's read on. The Lord look on it and repay. So verse 23, it happened in the spring of the year that the army of Syria came up against him, and they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the leaders of the people from among the people and sent all their spoil to the king of Damascus. 4 verse 24, the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men, but the Lord delivered a great army into their hand. And here's why. And here it is again. Because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. So they executed judgment against Joash. And verse 25, when they had withdrawn from him, for they left him, speaking of Joash, severely wounded, we're told parenthetically. And this is crazy. <laughs> His own servants conspired against him 
because of the blood of the sons of Jehoiada the priest. And get this, his own servants killed him on his bed. So he died, and they buried him in the city of David, but they did not bury him in the tombs of the kings. These are the ones who conspired against him. We get their names. Zabad, the son of Shimeath, the Ammonites, interesting, and Jehazabad, the son of Shimrith, the Moabites. This is modern day Jordan, known then as Moab. Now, verse 27, concerning his sons and the many oracles about him and the repairing of the house of God, indeed they are written in the annals of the book of the kings, and we did study them in First and Second Kings. Then Amaziah, his son, reigned in his place. What an end to a chapter, right? <laughs> it's ironic. There's actually a number of ironies here, chief of which is that Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, is murdered at the command of Joash in the same exact place that Joash was anointed. That's ironic. But God. But God brings about his just judgment by way of the Syrian army coming against him, which ultimately brings about his death. And talk about an irony. His death is brought about by the hand of his own servants. And we're told that it was because he brought about the death of Jehoiada's son, Zechariah, by his own hand. You know what that tells me? When at the command of Joash, Jehoiada was killed, the servants of jo Joash at that instant turned on him. Because he had turned on Jehoiada and had the son of Jehoiada, Zechariah, killed. And that's why they killed him. That's really interesting to me. Adam Clark captures the intensity of this in his commentary. He writes, what a most wretched and contemptible man was this, who could imbrue his hands in the blood of a prophet of God and the son of the man who had saved him from being murdered and raised him to the throne. Alas, alas. At the end of that year, the Syrians came against Judah, destroyed all the princes of the people, sent their spoils to Damascus, and Joash, the murderer of the prophet, the son of his benefactor, was himself murdered by his own servants. Here was a most signal display of the divine retribution. Thus ended a reign full of promise and hope. And it was. In the beginning, but profligate, cruel, and ruinous in the end. And then he says this, and I had to kind of reread this. And I think he's, he's right. This is true. Think about this. Never was the hand of God's justice more signally stretched out against an apostate king and faithless people than at this time. And it was a swift judgment, wasn't it? At his command, he has Zechariah killed. And within that year, a matter of months, the Syrian army comes against him, and then he's killed by the hands of his own servants. I want to close with a quote from G. Campbell Morgan. He sums it up perfectly this way, concerning the life of Joash. He says this, The study of the story of Joash offers a striking illustration of how a weak man is easily influenced. It emphasizes the need of strong individual character which can only be created by direct dealing with God. 
No man should be in the way in between us and God as Jehoiada was to him. He didn't have that personal relationship with God himself. It was dependent upon a man. He goes on to say, However valuable the influence of a good man may be, it remains true that if a man have nothing more to lean on than that, if it should fail, and it will, and it did, collapse is almost inevitable. All foundations fail save one. Reminds me of the parable that Jesus spoke of about upon which foundation is your life built? Is it built upon the rock? Immovable. When the storms come, no problem. Or is it built on the sand? The shifting sand. When the storm comes, it collapses. I want to share one last uh, thing before we bring the Bible study to an end. When we lived on the mainland, my wife and I used to go to a Christian conference center in Cannon Beach, Oregon. And if you've ever seen pictures of this place, it's really beautiful, right there on the, on the coast, on the, on the water, on the beach. And they have, uh, and it's called Haystack Rock. It's kind of a, you know, a, a, a focal point. And it's, depending on the tide, it's right there in the water, and it's this huge rock. And w one year we stayed in a hotel room that was right there on the beach, and we could look at Haystack Rock. And he, he, one particular day, the waves are crashing in against this rock. And the birds that are on that rock are oblivious to the waves crashing below. And all they're doing is singing as if they're praising God, their Creator. No, no worries, I'm on this rock. Those waves can crash all they want. Nothing's going to move me because they're on the rock. And I thought, what a, what a perfect and, and beautiful picture of how it is when our foundation is on the rock of Jesus Christ. Immovable. That's our foundation. I guess in some way you could see Jehoiada as a foundation of sand upon which the life of Joash was built. And as such, it was just a matter of time before it all comes crashing down, and certainly it did in his life. Oh, would to God, would to God, that our lives would be built on that immovable rock, the foundation of which is the person of Jesus Christ. Why don't you stand? We'll pray. Lord, we love your word. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for including in Scripture all of these details. Here we are, are all these generations later, and your word is so alive, it is so active, it is so sharp, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to cut between soul and spirit, bone and marrow. And certainly it has done that here for us tonight. Lord, would you now, by the Holy Spirit, search our hearts, Take these things that we've seen here, the lessons that are to be learned here. And Lord, by the Holy Spirit, would you enable us to make application of them to our lives? Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.